what advice would you give to a up and coming designer whose ambitions are not Nike? It's it's the it's the Facebook, the Metas, the working at Netflix, where you're working on like 2D interfaces. What would you recommend so that they could develop more influence? Because this is something that you're obviously really good at is developing influence and respect with peer groups. Like what advice would you give that that person that has ambitions to change the world or make or make the most the best experience possible or product possible? How do you temper that enthusiasm to do the right thing? But you know, understand where to stop. That's a great question. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I've, I've worked with on physical product experiences for a number of digital first companies and something that I've noticed. So I don't know if this is translates to all of them, but there is almost a willingness to ship things that, um, maybe aren't perfect because they could be fixed later. Right. Which is something you can do in software that you can't do it in hardware. And so I remember working with Google on a bunch of hardware for Google TV, and there was this push of, let's just get it out there and we'll fix it later. I'm like, it doesn't, you, it doesn't work that way with hardware, right? Yeah, if, if the search window doesn't work great, I'm not that mad because it didn't cost me anything and it will change tomorrow and they'll fix it. But you know, if I buy a physical product and you could go back to the very first Android phones and it doesn't work right, now I'm very mad because I spent my money on it and it can't be fixed and I will never come back to your brand. Like you lost me forever. Basically you broke my trust. I'm not going to give you a second chance. And as industrial designers, I think we're trained to really think of the object, what we ship as final. This is it. This is the artifact for all time. And I just wonder, and again, this could be incredibly naive and I, I apologize if it is. I wonder if UX designers and digital designers could benefit a, a little bit more from that kind of a thinking. What if you couldn't fix it? Like, what if what you shipped had to be right and couldn't be fixed? And would that then lead you to be like, okay, let's focus on creating a product that's a little bit more bulletproof in something instead of something that's a little bit more of an experiment? And I, I again, I think because we have these limitations in, in physical product design, of not only the hardware that we ship, but the base components that are sourced, right? You talked about sourcing the keys for the Apple keyboard, right? We're so reliant on a lot of these, these base elements, not on like software where you have, you build up kind of the tech deficit of code, um, but we're, we're so focused on kind of getting those base elements, right? Because we know we might not just be stuck with that button for this product, but if the company develops that button mechanism, we might be stuck with it for the next five, six iterations of this product. Um, and I, you see it all the time when in software interfaces where things change and you're like, why, why did this change? Like, I feel like the HBO max app finally got functional and then they like blew it up and made the max app. Like you, you for like four years, you finally got it to a good space and then you like went backwards. <laughs> and, and so I don't know if it's like, there's this kind of like, because there's the ability to make changes, changes happen. And maybe that's not always the right thing. And that's really hard as a designer and a product person, but it might not be you know, the right thing to do for the user. I love that. And I want to respect your time, but what I heard from that, it, because it could be easily misinterpreted as we'll make the best thing because it might be the last time you get to ship it. It's like, no, 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 no. With the constraints available in this like the, the constraints that are apparent in the project if you only got to ship this once how do you make the most minimum commercializable viable version of this knowing that it might not get changed for a couple what would you do that's the challenge it's not make the one that you're most proud of or it's an expression of your artistic self like that's not designed that's right. at that point yeah and so did I understand that correctly? It's, it's like, okay, with the constraints that you have, the budget that you have, what's the most bulletproof version of this? That's right. And and I, it reminds me, I remember I was working, had this young designer that was working for me and he was really struggling on this project. And the engineers were complaining about him. They're like, Mark is just pushing too much. And, and I said, hey, Mark, go 
go print out, print out physically where you're at with the project, bring it over to the conference table and let's take a look. And I was just like, I was like, buddy, you're fighting the project. Like I could see you, I could see you are not listening to what the project is telling you. You are trying to force your vision onto it. And that's not our job. <laughs> and I was like, let's just zoom out together. And look, it was, he was again as a physical product and he was trying to, it was a, it was a gaming headset that was to go with the Xbox one launch. And he was trying to do something crazy with the way it hinged. And I was like, it's, it's literally telling you not to do that. <laughs> like, just look at it, look at it, slow down, calm your, yourself, your, your inner voice and list not to be too like Zen, but listen to the project and it will tell you what it wants to be.